welcome to Talk to Internal Audit, our dedicated Facebook Live series. Today's session is all about our newly refreshed FS code, the Internal Audit Financial Services Code of Practice. So I hope you have a cup of tea or coffee and are ready to join me for a chat around how we might support each other in using the changes and implementing the changes to the code. So I'm Liz Sandwith. I'm the Chief Professional Practice Advisor at the Chartered Institute of Internal Auditors, UK and Ireland. The Chartered Institute is the only professional body dedicated exclusively to training, supporting and representing internal auditors in the UK and Ireland. We have approximately 10,000 members in all sectors of the economy, all parts of the UK and Ireland. Members are part of a global network of some 200,000 members in 170 countries, all working to the same international standards and codes of ethic. May I also remind you that you can acquire CPE points for these Talk to Internal Audit sessions. So don't forget to log them using our CPE template and details of how to claim your CPE point or points, actually it's half a point, from this live stream can be found in the comments section. Today's topic, our newly refreshed FS Code 2021, Internal Audit Financial Services Code of Practice, Guidance on Effective Internal Audit in the Financial Services Sector. The code has been refreshed to harmonize it with the Internal Audit Code of Practice for the private and third sectors that was launched in January 2020. Joining me to discuss the changes is Gavin Hayes, the Institute's Head of Policy and External Affairs. Together, Gavin and I will examine why the new F FS code matters to you if you're an internal auditor in the financial services sector. Remember, if you like fa Facebook streams and want to spread the word, and I'm sure you do, please uh, share today's live stream. You can do that by clicking the share button in the corner of your screen. The more the merrier. Gavin has been with the Institute for two and a half years and has been responsible for the Internal Audit Codes of Practice guidance. So welcome to Gavin. Just to provide some context in relation to why we're having this conversation today and why we have updated the FS code. In March 2020, we launched Stepping Up, reassessing the impact and implementation of the Financial Services Code. The findings of the research were encouraging, and we were pleased to see some areas had improved greatly. For example, the resources available to internal audit have increased. So has the dialogue between internal audit and regulators. And we have also seen a further jump in the number of chief audit execs saying their rank was now equivalent to the C-suite executives, such as the CFO. However, some results were less positive with regards to access to executive committee board papers, for example. However, when reading this report, one ought to be mindful that the code is principles-based guidance that is aimed to be applied appropriately and proportionately. Not all internal audit functions are the same size or have access to the same resources. This has the potential to affect how they comply with the guidance, which can be observed in the survey results. If you haven't had a look at the report, it might be worth having a look and it's available on our website. 45% of respondents came from small internal audit functions. And in isolating this cohort of the sample, we saw lower rates of reported compliance with the code. Since its first publication in July 2013, the Financial Services Code has played a pivotal role in raising the professional bar across internal audit in the financial services sector. This latest third edition of the code only contains minor changes to the previous edition we published in 2017. The main reason, as I mentioned earlier, 
for revising the code is because in January 2020, building on the success of the FS code, we published our internal audit code of practice guidance on effective internal audit in the private and third sectors. Following the publication of the new code, there was a need to revise and republish the financial services code to harmonize the two codes where it is appropriate so to do. Although the FS code still contains provisions specific to internal audit operating in the FS sector. The code applies to organizations operating in the FS sector, as I've mentioned, all of whom should have an internal audit function and an audit committee of non-exec directors. This code contains provisions which are specific to the FS sector. Internal audit functions outside of the FS sector and within the private and third sectors should follow our internal audit code of practice, guidance for effective internal audit in the private and third sectors that we published in January 2020. If you're just joining us, welcome to our live stream Talk to Internal Audit. Today's session is all about our newly refreshed FS code. And I'm joined by Gavin Hayes, the Institute's Head of Policy and External Affairs. And together we are examining what changes the code features and why they're important. So now may I turn to Gavin, our guest for today. I thought it might be really nice if we found out a little bit about Gavin. I know about him because I work with him at the Institute, but I thought it would be useful if you understood a little bit more about Gavin. So Gavin, please may I ask us to tell us, ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself, how you see your role at the Institute, and did you ever expect to become something of an internal audit geek? Well, uh, Liz, thanks very much uh, for that introduction. And I'm delighted to be on today's uh, Talk to Internal Audit um, to discuss the revised and refreshed uh, financial services code of practice. Um, as you know, Liz, my background is in fact in public policy campaigns um, and communications. Um, and my previous role was working for the business membership organization, uh, London First, as their aviation campaign director, um, where I set up and led uh, their airport expansion campaign, uh, Let Britain Fly. Um, so uh, given that background, I certainly did not um, expect to be something, uh, to become something of an, an, an internal audit geek. But then I guess I never really expected to become something of an aviation geek in my previous role. Um, but nonetheless, um, I do really enjoy working on big and sometimes contentious uh, policy issues. Um, and obviously um, airport expansion was an example of that. But then equally, um, as we've seen over the last uh, few years, uh, particularly following uh, the collapse of Carillion, um, you know, there, there's been a big debate um, on the future of audit um, and corporate governance. Um, and of course, a lot of that focus is on external audit. But, you know, it's really important that internal audit also has um, a voice in that debate. Um, and that we are seen as part of the solution um, to some of the corporate governance and audit issues um, that we've seen um, over recent years um, in relation to various high profile um, corporate uh, collapses. Um, and that's really where my role um, comes into play as head of policy um, and external affairs, uh, you know, working to raise the profile and influence of the Institute um, and the wider uh, profession. Um, and, and, you know, one of the uh, projects that I've really enjoyed uh, working on um, over the last uh, couple of years um, has been the development um, of the internal audit code of practice. Um, and now obviously uh, working on the revised uh, financial uh, services uh, code, uh, because I think uh, both codes um, ha have a really important role to play um, at increasing um, the influence um, of internal audit uh, professionals. 
um, as, as in fact we have already seen um, with the success of the Financial Services Code um, at raising the scope, the skills um, and the status of internal audit um, across the financial services sector. Thank you ever so much, Gavin. So now we know you're both an internal audit geek and an aviation geek. Um, it must be brilliant for your CV. Thank you for sharing that with us. And you are so right uh, as to the importance of our two codes. So following the positive messages, as you said, from the Stepping Up March 2020 report, uh, why did you think it was necessary to consider updating the FS code 2017? And if we look for a moment at the Stepping Up uh, report, and as you mentioned, it's been split into three areas, scope, status and skills. I thought it might be interesting just to share um, with our listeners some of the um, great stats. So in terms of scope, 96% who responded to the survey said the scope of their work is unrestricted. 81% in terms of status said that they are line managed by their audit committee chair and 78% in terms of skills have a secondary reporting line to the CEO with regular access. So Gavin, tell us now a bit more about why it was appropriate to update the code. Well, the, the main reason um, why we updated uh, the financial services code uh, what was because, as you know, um, about a year ago now, um, in January 2020, uh, we published our internal audit um, code of practice. Um, and so following the publication of the new code, um, that then meant that we ha had to update um, the financial services code uh, to make sure that the two were harmonised. Um, where it was appropriate to do so. But as you also alluded to in your opening remarks, the Financial Services Code uh, still includes um, a number of provisions that are specific um, to the financial uh, services uh, sector. Um, and, and, and that is still the case um, in this latest version of the code that we've just published. Thank you, Gavin. And that, as you so rightly say, is so important that it is relevant specifically to the FS sector. So I wonder if you could walk us through now the process that you went through to update the code. For example, who did you speak to and what did they have to say? Well, for this particular review, uh, we didn't feel it necessary to set up um, an independent uh, review uh, committee. Uh, because, as I just explained, it was a relatively um, straightforward um, and light touch uh, revision process uh, to ensure harmonisation um, and consistency uh, between the two codes. However, um, we did feel it very important um, to consult uh, with key stakeholders on the proposed uh, changes. Um, and so therefore, you know, we reached out um, to Mike Ashley, who's the audit committee chair of Barclays, um, who chaired uh, the previous independent review committee back in 2017, because uh, we thought that it was really important to consult with him, um, given his expertise um, and experience of working on the code. Um, we reached out to a range of chief audit executives from the financial services sector, uh, you know, representing um, the various um, subsectors, um, including involving members uh, of the financial services panel, um, as well as, of course, uh, internal audit uh, forum members. Um, and last but not least, uh, we consulted with the financial services regulators, uh, so the Prudential Regulation Authority um, and the Financial uh, Conduct Authority uh, too. Um, and, and finally, you know, this, this whole process um, was of course approved by council um, and they got to rubber stamp the final version of the codes that we have now published. Thank you, Gavin. So there was quite a process of consultation, which I think for those listening will be really important um, to understand that. So I wonder now if you would um, dig a little deeper, get perhaps get a little more granular 
and provide us with an update as to some of the key changes. For example, I noticed that there is a change in the wording regarding the relationship between internal and external audit. Yeah, so the important message to get across uh, to viewers is that, uh, as we've both said, um, by and large, we've only made minor changes um, for harmonisation and consistency purposes. Um, however, one uh, important change um, that I actually think um, is, is a positive uh, change um, that you've just uh, mentioned um, is, is the new version of the code uh, talks about the importance um, of regular communication um, and sharing of information between internal audit and external audit. Um, and important uh, communication between uh, the two assurance functions uh, was something that Sir Donald Bryden picked up on um, as, as part of his independent review into the quality and effectiveness of audit. Um, and indeed, it was great um, that Sir Donald Bryden referenced um, our code of practice um, in the final report um, of the review into audit that, that he undertook. Um, so, so that's definitely um, one key change um, that I would highlight and I think that viewers um, should reflect on. Um, another change that is, is specifically um, relevant uh, to the financial services uh, sector um, is, is the section in the code uh, that talks about the scope of internal audit. Um, and under the scope of internal audit, um, the code uh, talks about um, the scope including capital uh, and liquidity risk. Um, and in this new version of the code, um, we say that internal audit within financial services should also include within its scope uh, the, the, the process um, for stress testing um, in relation to significant uh, economic uh, shocks. Um, and I think this, this addition to the code's wording is particularly relevant um, given the current economic context um, in relation to COVID. So th those, I think, are, are two key changes that I would highlight uh, to viewers. Uh, but as I say, by and large, um, it's minor changes that we've made. Thank you, Gavin. Um, as you referenced, um, you know, we've had the pandemic over the, the last 10 months and internal auditors I'm aware of are probably, you know, far busier than they've ever been before. So may I ask you what you and the Institute perhaps anticipate CAE's heads of internal audit will do with the revised code? It doesn't feel and you have said the same, really, as though the, the changes are particularly significant. So do you think there is merit in a detailed briefing um, to the internal audit key stakeholders, the audit committee, senior management? Or do you think there is a, a message to share? So should we do a briefing or not? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I think the publication of the refreshed financial services code uh, does in fact provide um, a great opportunity uh, for chief audit executives and their internal audit teams uh, to once again uh, review uh, the code's recommendations, uh, you know, reassess how it's being applied within their own organisations. I mean, absolutely, you know, they should be using this as an opportunity uh, to engage uh, their audit committee chairs in particular. Uh, and, you know, both of our codes are intended to be living documents that internal audit functions should be referring to uh, regularly uh, and using it as, in, uh, as guidance to increase the effectiveness of their internal audit uh, functions. So, in fact, we would urge viewers uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to set up a meeting um, and, and to share the new code um, with their audit committee chair uh, and other stakeholders. Thank you, Gavin, a, a really good answer and um, something for us all to um, bear in mind in terms of, you know, talking to our audit committee chairs and other stakeholders. So it's a great answer. Thank you. So what are the next steps? If this is a harmonization refresh rather than a significant review, 
do you have plans uh, for a more formal review? If so, do you have an idea when that might be and what the process will be? And should we look out for a survey from the Institute um, in terms of the FS code? So th there are currently no confirmed plans for a more formal review of the financial services code. Um, however, um, the feedback from some stakeholders on, on, on this latest um, revised version of the code um, was that um, there could be merit um, in, in having a more wide ranging review of the code by say 2022. Um, this was certainly the view of the Prudential uh, Regulation Authority, uh, for example. Um, so, you know, th th this is something that we will need to reflect on um, very uh, carefully. Um, and, and, you know, in particular, um, how this would work in practice, because, of course, we now don't just have one code. Um, we have two codes. We have the code uh, for non-financial services organisations, um, in addition to the codes for, for financial services. So I think if there was to be a review, um, we would probably want to review uh, both codes um, in tandem. Um, and, and I think for any uh, more wide-ranging um, formal uh, review, um, we would also need to look to set up an independent review committee uh, to look in detail um, at those more, uh, uh, at, at, at those, uh, at those changes. Okay, thank you very much. So something more to come, but not yet formalized. So thank you for that, Gavin. Looking back, and you've talk, talked about COVID, the, the last 10 months have been incredibly challenging for all internal auditors, and, you know, not just internal auditors, but organizations uh, generally, I think. So do you think that the challenges experienced and anticipated as we go through the next 18 to 24 months, um, will that be part of the approach, do you think, to the significant review when it comes 22-23? Yeah, I mean, I think that the last, uh, you know, the last 10 months have been incredibly challenging um, for all of us working in internal audit. Um, as in fact we saw um, through our internal audit in lockdown research, which is of course um, available um, on the website. You know, in recent months, we've seen significant uh, numbers of internal audit uh, professionals um, being redeployed to other parts of the business. You know, some have been furloughed um, and sadly, you know, we have seen um, redundancies um, and, you know, Perhaps this is less of an issue um, in financial services where, you know, it's mandatory to have an internal audit function. But this is obviously something that we will need to keep a careful watch on um, very carefully. Um, and I think that one of the um, impacts um, of the pandemic um, on, on the internal audit profession um, has been to sort of accelerate, if you like, um, some of the changes that we're seeing coming down the track, um, particularly in terms of the increased use of technology in internal audit functions, you know, in terms of data analytics and artificial intelligence that enables um, remote uh, auditing. Um, so like, like other professions, um, I, I think, um, you know, the pandemic um, has brought about uh, te technological changes um, and, um, and I, you know, I, I think uh, moving forwards, uh, you know, increasingly um, we're going to see the use of uh, data analytics and, 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 and artificial intelligence. So to, to remain um, relevant, um, we will need to make sure that both of our codes reflect the modern uh, internal audit uh, function. Um, so I believe we will need to consider the, the development of new technology um, and new ways of auditing um, in our next review uh, of the codes. Thank you for that, Gavin. And so relevant because, you know, as I know you're aware, because you're part of the um, 
group at the Institute that is looking on shaping the future of the profession, looking ahead to 2025. So, you know, all of the things you've just discussed absolutely will form part of that agenda. Um, so it's good to see how these things interlink with each other. So I, I wondered if there was anything finally you'd like to share with us? No, I mean, I, I, I think that we've uh, covered everything um, quite uh, comprehensively. Um, as we've both said, um, you know, th this latest uh, revi revision um, only contains uh, minor changes. Um, the reason why we revised um, the code um, was really just for harmonization uh, processes. But I think this is a key opportunity for internal audit functions within financial services to once again um, review the code, um, assess how it's being applied in their own organisation um, and have that conversation with key stakeholders, including the audit committee chair, of course. Thank you, Gavin. And, uh, you know, you're, you're so right. That conversation with the audit committee chair and, of course, audit committee members even, perhaps. And that was one of the, the points that we highlighted um, in internal audit in lockdown in terms of um, the frequency of meetings, the ease of meetings using things like Zoom and Teams um, with our key stakeholders. Um, and therefore, perhaps that will facilitate the conversation that you have just referenced in relation to the new code, which is now on our website and is available to download, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes, I would definitely encourage viewers uh, to download uh, the new version of the code. Thank you very much, uh, Gavin. So can I just remind you, if you're just joining us, welcome to our live stream, Talk to Internal Audit. Today's session was all about our newly refreshed FS code. And I was fortunate to be joined by Gavin Hayes, the Institute's Head of Policy and External Affairs. And together we examined what changes the code features and why they are important. May I say a huge thank you, Gavin, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts with us. Lots for us to reflect on and to discuss with our internal audit colleagues and also, as Gavin has suggested, um, enough for an agenda conversation with our chair of our audit committee. The live stream is available afterwards for those of you whose friends, colleagues may have missed the live version on the Institute's Facebook channel. Please follow all of the exciting things the Institute is doing on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. As a member, you have access to the latest edition of Audit and Risk magazine, which is also available on our website. And the uh, January version of the magazine uh, is interesting because January is normally a time to, to look back and reflect on the past year as we plan for the next one. But this year is different. Reflecting on the risks and challenges we faced in 2020 is of limited use perhaps in planning for 21, 2021. So instead we must look forward bravely at all the changes we can expect to see in the next 12 months. COVID vaccine programs, post pandemic challenges, economic recession, Brexit, climate change will all make their mark. We're heading rapidly, I think, for a perfect storm. So we will need to reset our plans from where we are today, not from where we were before the pandemic. So highlights in the magazine include how to stay relevant in a changing world, internal audit skills for the future. What sort of skills do we need? What to expect at our audit and risk awards 2020? Um, I hope you've either already submitted your application for the awards. Um, if not, please um, have a look at our website and get your application in quickly. There are five categories of awards, outstanding team, there are four subcategories, financial services, of course, that's what we're talking about today, private, non-financial services, public and charities. There is an inspirational leader award, uh, best innovation in training and development, and also change and innovation in response to a crisis. 
So what did you do in 2020 as a result of the pandemic? And what would you like to share with your colleagues and our members? And there's also a very unique award this year, uh, which is Outstanding Contribution to Corporate Governance by an Audit Committee Chair. This is one where you as CAE Head of Internal Audit will be nominating one your Audit Committee Chair. And this is in respect of um, Sarah Blackburn, who worked long and hard around corporate governance for the Institute and the profession generally. And we lost her in um, spring last year. So this is in memory of Sarah. So please, as a head of internal audit, think about your audit committee chair and whether you would like to nominate them for the work they've done around the corporate governance agenda. I'm happy, as always, to take questions via my email at liz.sandwith at iia.org.uk. In March, we will have another talk to internal audit where we will explore the challenges we're all facing as we find ourselves in a third lockdown with the daily stats increasing at an alarming rate. Our guest speaker will be looking at mental health issues, but from a very personal perspective, perhaps helping us all recognize that we have challenges. As we move forward into the future, please don't forget to look out for Talk to Internal Audit. Um, some of the ones that we published in 2020, we're now republishing on YouTube. And of course, as we face 2021 head on, we will continue to share with you our thoughts regarding specific challenges, along with input from colleagues, members and subject matter experts as guests. If you have any specific topics you would like us to cover, please share your thoughts in the comments box. Remember, talk to internal audit. The Institute is listening. Thank you. Stay safe.